And it's important to be ready and willing, prepared to fight. I don't know. So then I also went to the building a PR campaign talk. I think this kind of thing's really interesting and it can be relevant to anyone. So I always like to hit up a few like marketing and PR talks. And so this talk was done by the guy that started Polymath PR and he was super knowledgeable, really interesting to listen to. Um, he's worked with a whole bunch of people and his talk was really good. And basically some of the takeaways that I had from his talk was, you know, um, a lot of the standard stuff, like, you know, he talked about the importance of a business-oriented attitude. He really focused a lot on treating what you do like a business, even though it might be art, it might be music. Uh, you want to be a recognizable brand that people can trust. So you want to brand yourself. You want to put that effort in to, to define what your brand is and then stick to it, right? And he mentioned a lot of stuff that other PR people will mention, right? So he talked about asking who is your target audience, uh, asking yourself what is your message so you can get that across efficiently, uh, asking yourself why people should care so that you can actually motivate people to care about your brand, about your music. And an interesting point that I thought was really good advice from him was to pick your idols and research the heck out of them to try to understand what made them successful, right? So, so you know, pick who you want to be like, who you idol, and then try to pick apart and analyze what made them so successful. And something that I think needs to be said a lot more in all aspects of life is he mentioned that not knowing something is not a fundamental flaw, right? So it's okay to go out and ask people that you idolize or that you respect or that you want to be like, um, go out and ask them for advice or to share their knowledge with you, right? It's okay to not know everything. I mean, none of us know everything, right? So I thought that was a really good point. I mean, it's kind of how I live my life, but I really don't know how you could learn uh, quickly and efficiently without having that kind of attitude because otherwise you're just blocking yourself from learning new stuff. So yeah, he also talked about the importance of hiring a team, right? So people like photographers, designers, so on. Um, and he talked about how everyone in a band, for example, has to be all in on that idea for that to work, right? So you want to make sure that whoever you're working with as a band, you're all in for the same ride, so to speak. And as part of that, he also talked about the importance of communicating with band members and the people that you're working with about the relationship. And he said that because, you know, he was talking a lot about how it's important to know that you don't have to stick with any one person if the relationship is not working. Like you don't have to be cruel or judgmental if you quote unquote break up with someone that's in your band. But, you know, just to keep the show on the road, it's important to make sure like if you're all in, the rest of the band should also be all in, right? And so another idea that he mentioned, and I've heard similar ideas mentioned in other industries, and I think it's a great way to operate, is he mentioned the three-month rule. And so that's basically the idea behind like all the versions of this idea is that you pick a time frame and then you set goals, to, like tangible goals to achieve within that time frame. And then you reevaluate at the end of the time frame and say, did I meet these goals? You know, how close did I get to these goals? Um, what did I accomplish in the past three months? And that's a good tangible way to keep yourself or hold yourself reliable for what you're achieving, what you're accomplishing in terms of your career, right? He also said that you should consider multiple revenue streams based on the goods you're selling, right? So if you're a band, you have your music, but you also want to think about your merch, for example. And so for anything that you're selling, whether or not it's your music or your merch, you want to make sure that it actually fits in with that brand identity that you've already defined. And so part of that was he talked about band logos, right? So he talked about the hymn logo with the pentagram and the heart and how much money they made just off merch with that logo. You know, and he mentioned how that logo was everywhere, almost more so than their actual music. And he was talking about how if you develop a look or a brand, you know, a logo that you can easily market, um, then that can really help you as a band, as a musician. So, you know, I know we often think about the logo and the art as secondary to our music, but he was really pointing out that that can be an avenue into people finding you and learning about your music, right? So that can almost be like a funnel that leads people towards your stuff. If your branding is done very, very well and it spreads, it can really help new people find your music. 
So he recommended, you know, looking at other brands that have worked and try to understand why it worked, right? Right. And so besides just talking about the him logo, he also talked about stuff like the Kiss logo, the Rolling Stones logo, you know, these logos that have become iconic in and of themselves and how those can really contribute to the success of a group or at least contribute to their wallets, right? Because it can sell a shitload of merch. So yeah, he also talked about building a story around your project. So he said it was vital to have a story when you're pitching yourself, right? Uh, People become more attached to stories, right? So they'll become more attached to you when you have a story and when you're communicating a story. And your ability to communicate will actually define how successful you are, right? Because it's important that people can relate to you. He also talked about vulnerability and artists that talk about loss or personal development in their interviews or books or what have you. And he said that, you know, if he feels like a band or an artist is aligned with him in terms of how they're trying to make the world a better place or what they've gone through, then they're more likely to get his money. And that's the case for a lot of people. And so he said, you know, it's okay to open it up. It's okay to show vulnerability because sometimes that can really help people relate to you as a person so he said you know find relatable elements of your story and push that hard and find something that speaks to people on a personal level beyond just you know your music and you know he did say to avoid politics which might be kind of an obvious one to do Um, but you know in general he talked about communicating well taking the time to communicate with people effectively and to make sure that like whoever you're working with in terms of your band or your photographer or your artist that they are in line with your ideals and your goals and your desires and that um, they're the kind of people that you want to do business with. And so he also talked about the fundamentals of a good PR campaign, right? So he said a publicist can help you get in the media by any means possible. Um, So you want to find someone that's a good writer that can write a good biography and communicate your story well and that'll be a good person to be your publicist whether you know they're professional or not. It depends on you know what where you are in terms of your career. Um, He also recommended finding an image that works for you for your photos. So he recommended actually looking at film and magazines uh, that you like to see what appeals to you for ideas. So kind of look at those and dissect, oh, I like this kind of color scheme. I like this kind of vibe. I like this kind of look. Try to understand and analyze what you like about them and then try to come up with your image based off that research. And also when looking at your photos and your art and your merch, that you should ask yourself whether or not you would buy it. Like, does it look professional? Would you actually spend money on this? Because I guarantee if you wouldn't spend money on your own merch, then no one else is going to, right? And so that was kind of the idea that he was getting into, that that you should look at it and say, would I buy it? Does it look professional? So yeah. Um, another thing that he said was that it's important to be able to say who you're like in terms of other bands. Um, I know a lot of people will steer away from being like, oh, these are my influences or I'm like these bands because then it's like you're kind of defining yourself before people have even listened to your music. But he said that it's good to be able to do that because if you're clear on your influences, that helps the right people find you, right? If someone writes an article about a band and they're like, oh, their music is great, this and that, blah, blah, blah. If they then compare this group to a couple bands that you like, you're more likely to go out there and listen to that group now. So he said, it's good to be clear on your influences and share who your influences are when you're in interviews or when you're writing press releases or what have you. He also said when you're working on your music that it's good to have like at least three singles to go before and after your EP. And he said to have at least three videos. And he said, you know, videos are so expensive, but they're so important because they give people new to you an idea of who you are as a person it helps with your brand identity and it helps draw new people in because you know people aren't really quick to spend money and seeing a video on youtube is actually a really good way for people to find your music without without doing that so he said you know when working on your video when working on your content any kind of content that it's good to try to make content that people are going to be interested in and to demonstrate your knowledge and ability while displaying your personality so no matter what you're doing you want to make sure that you're displaying your personality but also bringing in some relevant and I guess, helpful content, which is what I'm trying to do here, right? And so he also said that, you know, Spotify algorithms are constantly changing. I mean, we all know that, right? And so his argument was that you shouldn't really stress about it too much, but that you should try to play within the system. So... And so something that I thought was a really helpful piece of advice that he said was that you should go out and try to find the people that are making playlists and then approach them. So he said one of the things you can do is offer them something like a first play or something that's exclusive, you know, give them exclusivity for your single, for example, and offer them that as part of a deal if they promote you on their playlist or on their website or on their platform, whatever it is, right? 
So I thought that was a really helpful tip, right? If you give people exclusivity, it's more exciting for them. It's a boost for their platform. And then they can help you back. Another piece of advice that I 100% agree with in in a lot of areas of my life is that among your audience, you should make any positive news a shared victory. So the idea behind that is that it's really good when people feel involved, right? And so like, for example, if you win some kind of award and you're like, oh, I won this award, I did this, I'm great, blah, 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 that's gonna read totally differently than if you're like, hey, we did this, we got this many views, we got this many listens, and now we got this award because of it. And you know, if you make it a we thing, they're going to feel involved. They're going to feel a part of it. And you know, they usually are a part of it, right? Like you're not going to get recognition if you don't have any views or you don't have any listens. And all these people are a part of you getting those views and you getting those listens. You wouldn't have it without them. So if you acknowledge that and you make it a we thing, then it's just like a, it feels better to everyone involved. And then people want to, to continue to help you, right? Because it's like they're part of the group that's making this possible. So, you know, making it a wee thing with your audience, but also with anyone that's involved in whatever you've done, right? Always tag everyone that's involved. You know, he said it's important to do that because it's a joint victory and it's a good thing to acknowledge that. It always helps you to acknowledge that. So then he also talked a little bit about your EPK, right? So if you're a band or a musician and how, you know, it should include your bio, big accomplishments, pictures, artwork, logos, upcoming show dates, festivals that you've played at, things like that. And he said, you know, to make an EPK so that it's clear that you're serious and you have a goal in mind. So if a band approaches someone for any kind of thing, like a gig or promotion or something like that, and they don't have an EPK, they don't look as professional. And so they're less likely to get that, higher end recognition or the higher end gig so he said it was great to make an epk no matter what you know just overdo it if anything and you know he said it's great to hire a designer to help you make your epk Another thing that he talked about was understand the 24-hour news cycle right so understanding what's going on in pop culture at any given time and how that can help you when you're prepping your stuff right so for example he talked about a band that he was working for and how he prepped a top 10 marvel movies list for the band member that was you know the biggest nerd about that stuff and so then he released that top 10 list to press companies and it's kind of like a fun thing to do and he said it's a great way to engage with people on social media and it's also a good way to tap into another audience you know a wider audience And that's part of how people can get to know you. So it's a really great tool to use to like tap into whatever's going on in pop culture at the time. And it's also a great way to get brand association, right? So if you find a way to be vocal on social media and in the press about something in pop culture or the 24 hour news cycle that you're passionate about, then that can really help you as a band. But of course, you know, he said avoid politics. So that's that's good to know. And that's basically it for that talk. Uh, During the q and I thought it was kind of cool. A woman in the audience was PR for Cardi B, and she jumped in about how negative press is good as long as it's relatable and not about politics. So we had a little conversation during the Q&A about negative press and, like, you know, where the line is with that. And I think it does depend on the genre. You know, she was talking about that a little bit, too, how depending on the branding of the artist and the genre that they're in, the line for where negative press is good or bad can be very different, right? Okay, and so I think the last talk that I'm gonna talk about is the business of being a freelance studio engineer talk. Um, Super relevant to me, super relevant to, I think, a bunch of you guys. Um, And that talk was done by Dom Morley, and so he's a Grammy Award-winning producer, mixer, and engineer, right? And here's his website if you wanna check it out, dommorley.com. And so I think he talked about three main topics within his talk, right? So he talked about money management, the future of work, and mental health. So for money management, he talks about a lot of the basics for how he runs his business, right? So he's mentioned that he takes 50% up front before he even makes the booking. And that's just because he wants to make sure that they're committed by taking the 50% before even scheduling them. And also so like if they drop out the day before, he doesn't now have an empty day where he's not booked and not making any money, right? So I mean, that's pretty logical. I think a lot of us do that. I do that. Um, And just to make sure that they're committed to him before he commits time to them, right? So that's pretty logical. I think that's pretty common with any type of freelance stuff. Um, So 50% deposit, right? Another thing that he suggested, and I've actually been doing this, but I never thought about it, I don't know, quite completely in the way that he mentioned it. But he mentioned that he makes a mix with a limiter on it so that the artist can enjoy listening to it. And he also said that he very purposely does that before he's taken that final 50% so that they can go and listen to it and enjoy listening to it and you know 
share it around the band, get feedback on the mix, stuff like that. But they don't have something that's usable and sendable to a mastering engineer until they've paid that second 50% to him. So the artist doesn't have anything that they can use essentially until that final 50% is paid, right? So I thought that was a great point. I've been doing that, but um, I haven't really thought about it in terms of getting that final deposit before taking the limiter off. You know, I just, I don't know why I just didn't think about it as completely yet. So I thought that was really cool. I thought that was a good point to make. Just, you know, make sure that you don't take that limiter off and send them a version without it until they've paid the final 50%. Another thing that he really focused on, and I think this is really important for people that are first starting out especially, is to make sure that your clients pay something so that they don't undervalue the product. And you know, he's talked about studies where they've had like similar or comparable products and when people pay more for it, there's some kind of a cognitive dissonance where it's like, you know, I paid more for this so it must be worth more, right? So there's some interesting psychology there. I'm sure you can look it up. I don't want to spend too much time dwelling on it. But basically, if you make them pay something, then they're less likely to undervalue your product, right? And so he also talked about late payment fees and why they're important to have. And he also mentioned that, you know, in your area, sometimes areas will have laws or rules about how much you should charge for late payment fees and how much you can charge for late payment fees um, and how it's sometimes a legal thing. And, you know, so he said to put a little blurb on your invoice and to say something like the terms are 30 days or whatever the term limit is that you've decided. And then just say something like if payment is made late, we can charge an interest and a debt recovery fee and then specify what that is. So yeah, he also talked about saving your money as much as possible, right? Because freelancing is pretty precarious. I'm sure a lot of us know that, right? But you know, he just said, be ready for sickness, holidays, quiet time, stuff like that. It's just good to be prepared, right? And you know, he mentioned that he's talked with people who are super successful, for example, people that have done Mix with the Masters, and they've said that they have slow times, you know, like, oh, I don't have anything coming in for next week. I'm not sure what I'm going to be doing. So you know, it's important to know that quiet work times happen to everyone. So don't be hard on yourself if you're a freelancer and you have a quiet time coming up. And so he also said, this is a little dry, but it's super important. But um, he also said to look into pensions, right? So you need to make your own as a freelancer and you should do it early because, you know, compound interest is your friend. And so he had a whole thing about pensions and how that's important to think about, to start to not procrastinate. Another great thing that he mentioned that I think is a great point for a lot of aspects of life is just that if there's something you can't do, bring someone in that can, right? You don't have to do everything. You know, specialization of labor can be a good thing, you know? So just be willing to bring in people that can do the stuff that you can't. And it doesn't have to be just creative stuff. And I think that can be great for different aspects of freelancing. But, you know, he mentioned stuff like getting an accountant, um, managers, PR people, so on, right? And he said, you know, for an accountant, it's good to get one that knows your industry because they'll earn you back as much money as the difference between them and someone that's not specialized, right? So it's great to get someone that knows your industry and also to invest in someone that knows how to do that, right? Like, I'm not an accountant, so I should hire an accountant. Duh. I mean, if I can afford it, right? Um, he also mentioned in terms of like managers, PR people, and so on, um, you know, managers help increase your network. They help with administrative stuff and just evaluate at the end of a year if they brought in as much new work for you as they cost you in fees. And that's a good way to do things to decide whether or not to hire a manager or keep your manager um, or your PR person or whoever it is. He also recommended the Six Figure Home Studio podcast. Sounds like it's really good. I actually don't listen to that one yet, so I'm going to check it out. And he also recommended reading articles on medium.com. Um, and he said that's because, you know, they have a lot of freelance writers that are writing about their freelance experience. And a lot of that stuff can be relevant to us as freelance engineers as well. So it's a good resource. So that was the money part of his talk. And then he had a whole section about the future of work, right? So one of the things he recommended was the book uh, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. And he was talking about how in the book they talk about the future of work, how we're in a new place in terms of work because, you know, work is shifting so fast that you don't or can't know what skills will be useful in the future. And you can't learn everything by age 20 anymore and then just do your work for the rest of your life, right? So the kind of the way that work operates – works, I don't know, is very different from how it used to be, right? You're not fully trained to do your job by age 18, 19, 20, and then you just coast forever, right? It's You constantly have to be learning. You constantly have to be um, developing your specialty. And, you know, he mentioned stuff like Google's Magento, which is using machine learning to do creative work and how, like, now it sucks, but uh, 
you know, what if this art eventually passed the Turing test and what are we going to do and how can we still stay relevant and prepared for change um, and be able to stay in the industry, right? So, you know, he mentioned that we should be prepared for change at a rate that humanity has never seen before and that it's really the survival of the most adaptable to change, which I think is a really good point. Things are changing very quickly and it's good to just be ready and willing and able to adapt to that change, right? One thing that he mentioned, and I didn't really know the definition of this term, but uh, he mentioned having a portfolio career. Apparently, I've been doing it. I didn't know. But basically, the whole thing about having a portfolio career, it means having a varied list of income streams so that you can uh, lean around in case things change, right? So for example, you know, if you're an engineer, you might want to make sample packs, have some library music that you're making or that you've made. Um, archiving and analog transfers is another good way to get like a varied revenue stream. You can upsell or rehash to bands, offering tech support and stuff like that. You could do session prep work for mixers, you know, tuning, timing, exporting stems for composers, stuff like that. You can also do podcasting. So like recording and editing podcasts for people, um, which I've done some of that. Um, teaching is another one that he mentioned. And that's another one that I do too. But he said that's especially important because nowadays more and more successful engineers are working out of their own places and they're not really sharing their knowledge anymore. So uh, more and more people are learning in a more, uh, I guess, conventional like teacher-student type of relationship. And that's new for our industry, right? So teaching is an important one and it's another way to get a varied revenue stream. And, you know, he mentioned an important point, and that's that all of these things lean on networking, right? So all of these things rely on you going out there and networking to develop and um, get that type of a gig. And so, you know, he was talking about how we like to stay in our comfort zones and, like, hide out in our home studios or what have you. But comfort zones are prisons, and networking is how you'll find all these interesting and weird things that you can do with an audio career. So yeah, he talked about how portfolio careers are actually really great because there's always something that you can do to make some money. So you're less likely to have like a really painfully slow period. But then there's a drawback, right? So there's always something that you can do. So it's a lot tougher to take uh, holidays off or, you know, turn off the work mode. So just be careful about that. And that's kind of how he leaned into the mental health part of his talk, right? So he talked about how a lot of us have to get better at taking days off when we need to take days off. So he mentioned a study that was done by the University of Westminster. And in that study, they found that people that work in the music industry are three times more likely to suffer from depression or anxiety, stuff like that. And so in this part of his talk, he talked about why that is. Is, right and it might be the precarious nature of what we do and that everyone feels that that feeling of like perhaps I'll never work again especially when you're having a slow period of work and he actually used an example from uh, it was Gene Hackman and Dustin Hoffman that like met up years after they've had their huge success right and they were talking and um, they were talking to each other about how they used to mention that um, you know, like perhaps I'll never work again feeling and how one of them asked the other, I forget which asked which, but like, you know, do you still have that feeling? And he was like, yeah, all the time. And they were both like, yeah, still have that feeling all the time. Every single time I wrap up a gig. So, you know, it's good to know that even people that are super successful, that are way up at the top, um, they still have a lot of these feelings and these issues that those of us have down below. And so, you know, he also mentioned 24-hour work days and exhaustion that contribute to this mental health issue in our industry. And also the idea of low to zero pay being an issue and then isolation, right? So isolation can be very lonely and um, it can be a huge problem, especially for like freelance engineers if we're just doing mixes in our home studios, you know, it's... Um, it can be very isolating and it's just, you know, he mentioned that it's good to find gigs that involve people to help with that, right? So um, even if it's very, very part time, you can find a gig where maybe you're teaching and then you go see people every so often, even if it's like one day a week or something like that. It's good to find a gig that involves people so you're not totally isolated. And, you know, he mentioned how educators need to talk about mental health a lot more so people can be more equipped to handle it. Um, you know, 60% of our industry has mental health issues at some point. So it's not something that we should just ignore. It's something that we should address. Um, you can alleviate that with help, right? So he mentioned the website musicindustrytherapist.com and how they're all experienced in the industry or have worked with a bunch of people that are in the industry and how, you know, it's a great site to get some help, right? Um, therapists can really help people just bounce ideas off them and help you develop and understand why you have certain anxieties about your career, or your life. So, and it can really help. It's like, you don't have to be in 
absolute dire straits to benefit from a therapist right and there shouldn't be so much stigma about it seriously guys like there just shouldn't be it's it's nothing to be embarrassed about and it shouldn't be anything that um, people should avoid because of stigma I think that's really I don't know dumb and so he also mentioned music cares right so it's like music cares but it's with one c in the middle and that's an organization in the u.s that's kind of similar to musicindustrytherapist.com um, i think music industry therapist is in the uk and then music cares is in the u.s so yeah that's basically that talk um, during the q a there are a few interesting points made i'm just scrolling through my notes here um, someone asked about determining your prices starting out and he was saying you know if you are just starting out as an engineer then maybe start low. Uh, so for an example, he said, take what an assistant is making and then triple that. And that could be a good starting engineer salary or pay, rate of pay, right? Um, and then another thing that I thought was really useful advice was he said, you know, if you're working with someone and it's kind of more of like a creative endeavor for both of you, it's not as much like client and um employee or whatever it is type of relationship he said you know maybe you can suggest that you split the studio costs so like when things are more speculative work um, where for example maybe you just kind of start jamming with people and then you start working with them on the side for fun and then it eventually becomes more like a job right and here you are not getting paid for this thing that you're doing that's really becoming more of a job and that can become a real issue and so the two things that he suggested for that is saying hey let's at least split the studio costs and then also uh, getting a manager can help with that. Um, and in terms of the idea of AIs or different things kind of uh, making our jobs obsolete, he did say that, you know, the need for human contact is pretty essential. So jobs that are protected are things like nurses, therapists, live performers, right? Um, and that was just an interesting thought to keep in mind when you're thinking about, you know, how... The industry is changing, the world's changing, what's my career going to look like in 20 years or 30 years or whatever it is, right? Also, he said that he has a short contract, so it's not too overwhelming. It's not too much of a buzzkill, right? So short contracts are pretty good. Yeah, so that's basically it. I went to another couple of talks, but I don't have a ton of notes on those. And I think this is pretty good summary of all the uh, stuff that I found valuable or interesting or what have you at these talks. So basically, um, I hope you guys liked that. I hope you found that useful, some of that info. Okay, and so as promised, I'm going to talk about how you can access this information. So basically, if you go to the nam.org website, so it's namm.org, and basically, let me backtrack for a second here. So at NAM, they have a bunch of talks, right? And there are some talks that are in individual booths, right? So like the Mix with the Masters booth or, you know, the Waves booth or what have you. And I do not think this is the case for those talks. But a bunch of the talks, including most of the ones that I talked about in detail today, are actually put on by the NAM organization. So they're like official NAM show talks. And those are usually in like side rooms or upstairs in the hotels or something like that. And so for each of those talks, NAM sends a camera crew to film those talks. So after one of the talks on Sunday, uh, myself and a friend went up to one of the camera guys and asked him about, you know, where this footage ends up and if we can access it. And he said that if you go to the NAM website and you go over to this NAM U tab on the website, you can find all of these videos here. So right now, I believe all the videos that are up here are actually from last year. The guy did say that it might, like sometimes it, he said it takes them a few months to get the videos up on the website, but they will be up here eventually. So if you wanna watch some of these talks, you should be able to if you go to nam.org and then go to the Nam U tab. So this is a great resource. I have now started watching talks from previous years as well. Um, you know, they're just really helpful and super relevant talks to anyone that's in the industry. So I wanted to mention that for you guys so you know that this resource is out there. So um, have fun. Let me know if you see a talk that's really interesting on here and I will go watch it as well. So yeah, that's it for today. I hope you guys liked it. As usual, you know, hit the like button, subscribe to my channel, um, share my videos with anyone that you think might be interested, or just watch another video on my channel. That's super helpful for me with the algorithm right now. And if you do want to support my channel more directly, I do have a Patreon. So it's patreon.com slash Noise. And my patrons do get access to additional content. And, you know, it takes a lot of work to put up these videos. So I really appreciate you guys. The patrons really make this possible. I probably would not be still making videos if I didn't have any patrons. So, yeah, I really do appreciate my patrons. Thank you guys so much. You guys have a huge impact on this channel. Just 
It's amazing. So yeah, I come out with new videos every Wednesday and thank you for watching. Okay.